upon us for your ministry to us for all that you're doing oh god for all you have done we invite you into this service that you would have your way that you would move by the power of your spirit among us hallelujah even now we praise you for that we invite you lord god to cleanse us of all that would defile us all that would separate us from you lord god and then pour your spirit into us Hallelujah. We have need of you on today, and we want to be a blessing back unto you on this your day, this your Shabbat. We praise you for that. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. I'm so excited that you guys are, have joined us on today. I want to share with you guys the instructions for today so that you can allow the Lord to minister to you and we can all uh, say amen as we are in agreement together. If you're watching our Shabbat Temple service through a broadcast or video on Facebook or YouTube, I want to encourage you to send your prayer questions, prophetic revelations, and inquiries about connecting with this ministry to us at info at truthinspirit.org. You can also give your tithes, general offerings, shalamim offerings, first fruits, and monthly partnerships at any time via PayPal at truthinspirit.org slash giving, or you can give via cash app at dollar sign truth and spirit. If you use cash app, you can actually put in the four line, whether it's a tithe, offering, first fruits, monthly partnership, or Shalamin. As we know, Shavuot, also known as Pentecost, is tomorrow. So many of us, we are giving our Shalamin offerings now, which is a demonstration of how much God has blessed us. So we choose the amount to bless him back so that we can just thank him for what he's done. And then as we pour out into him and we bless him for Shavuot, um, the, the, the feast also known as Pentecost, then he pours a household blessing back upon us. That's the shame of me. Um, so I encourage you to let the Lord use you as you give in that way. I also want to encourage you to download our free burnt offerings workbook for deliverance um, and observance of the biblical feast, which include Rosh Hodesh and Shavuot, which is tomorrow. You'll find information about observing all those feasts in this workbook, which you can download for free at burntoffering.org. Additionally, if you need any more information, you can go to our website, truthinspirit.org. Now, I want to go over uh, the, the temple, which is an example, a model for worship for us so that God can minister to you and we can be in agreement in the way he wants to minister. Hallelujah. And so this model, it starts at the bottom because, you know, we're looking at entering in that, that building of the temple and going into the presence of God. But literally for those of us who are worshipers in this new covenant with the Lord, we want to rise up into his presence. We want to go up into the presence of the Lord. That's called Aliyah, rise up to Yah. Of course, that's a shortened form of the name of God, which is Yahweh. And so we want to rise up to him. So when you look at this diagram and you look at the words that accompany it on the, on the right side, you start at the bottom. So the very first place we enter is the outer court. That is the first label you see is the outer court. And in the outer court, you are prepared for worship. That's what's happening right now. Then you move into the in, inner court. And in the inner court, you either enter into or renew your covenant with the Lord and you confess and repent of sins. Then you move into the outer sanctuary. And in the outer sanctuary, you thank the Lord and you adore him for who he is and what he's done. You bless him out of the depths of your soul because your sin has been addressed and there's nothing obstructing your worship. And then he draws you into the inner sanctuary where you are in his presence. And I'm going to tell you, it's in that place that he speaks. And that is also the place where we want to make our request. We're actually going to look at that topic, enter God's presence today. That is actually the title of my sermon. And as we look at that topic, I'm going to come back to this uh, diagram of the temple. Because I want to share with you guys what this process looks like and how important it is for us as believers to actually come into the presence of the Lord, to come rightly into the presence of the Lord. And so I'm excited about sharing that with you guys. 
um, as we go forward. But certainly we are operating in this process today and always as the temple is our model for our Shabbat temple services, which is why they are called that. Our temple service order follows the nine steps for, nine steps for transformation that the Lord has given me, um, which are preparation, invitation, reconciliation, restoration, worship, witness, word, teaching, transformation, and transition. And so I praise the Lord um, as we go forward that we are able to, to really operate within this model that, that God has given us, these steps for transformation and be transformed as we also operate through the temple order on the model that he's given us. And so the preparation includes sounding the shofar, prayer, the instructions for the day, this, this temple service order, and entering into our or renewing our covenant with the Lord, which includes um, receiving him, actually praying the prayer of salvation. Um, and then we invite his presence. And so Elder Tamis is going to sing our liturgy, which is the Shema, Mikamoka, and Lothar Paramedia Sanctuary. We'll also have more praise and worship by the Davids. Um, and then we go into reconciliation, where we are reconciled in our relationship back to God. And this happens during praise and worship. So you should be confessing your sins. You should be repenting before the Lord so that he can use you and he can minister to you. Then we go into restoration, where now that we have really poured out all those things that obstruct our relationship with the Lord, he is able to pour in more of himself and restore us as we worship him and witness his glory. Um, and then he takes us into the most holy place. And that's where we hear his word. Prophetic revelation comes forth, teachings and sermons come forth. He transforms us. And then he sends us out in the transition to do his work that we will come back into his presence when he calls for us again. Now for us, that's tomorrow. We're actually gonna have another service tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We'll be right here. Um, and the reason being is because tomorrow is Shavuot, according to the biblical calendar um, and the scriptures that the Lord tells us to use when we're counting his biblical days. And so we will come together for Shavuot, which is a special Shabbat, which means not only is today a Shabbat, but tomorrow Shabbat too. We got a double Shabbat this weekend. Um, we're going to just let the Lord minister to us and, and bless us. And so when we transition out today, we are preparing to come right back in tomorrow into his presence in worship. So now I want to give you an opportunity to pray the prayer of salvation, because remember, when he brings us into the inner court, so we're just coming into the inner court experience right now, the first thing we have to do is enter into or renew covenant with him. A lot of times ministries do this part at the end. They see if people want to receive uh, the Lord, if they want to connect with the ministry, if they want to rededicate their lives to the Lord. The problem with that is the rest of us have actually traveled this journey and come into the presence of God. And anyone who's not in relationship with him or in right relationship with him has been standing out in the outer court the whole time. Be continually prepared for worship and never drawn into his presence. Today, as we look at that topic, enter God's presence, we want you to be drawn in. And so I want to encourage you, if you have never received the Lord as your personal savior, if you'd like to do that again, to say this prayer of salvation. As I speak it, you see the words in front of you, you certainly can speak it aloud. You want to say it with your mouth and believe it in your heart, because then you shall be saved. And after this, we will renew our covenant with the Lord um, as well, so that we're saved and in continual relationship with him. And so let's pray this prayer of salvation. Heavenly Father, I come to you in prayer asking for forgiveness of my sins. I confess with my mouth and believe with my heart that Yeshua, he died on the cross that I might be forgiven of my sins, reconciled in my relationship with you, live life abundantly on earth and live eternally in your presence. I believe that Yeshua rose from the dead and I ask you right now to come into my life, be my personal savior and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Empower me to repent of my sins and worship you all the days of my life. Your word is true. So I confess with my mouth and believe with my heart that I am born again and cleansed by the blood of Messiah Yeshua. In Yeshua's name I pray, amen. Now, if you pray that prayer, then you have received Yeshua. You are saved and he wants to minister to and through you, but you also need to be discipled, to learn more about this walk with him. I want to encourage you to send us an email at info, I-N-F-O, at truthinspirit.org. And I will personally get back with you that we can share some resources with you that you would learn how to walk this walk out with the Lord that he could minister to and through you. Now let us renew our covenant with the Lord. Or if you just prayed that prayer of salvation for the first time, you want to enter into covenant with the Lord. A covenant is an agreement with two, between two parties who are both taking on responsibilities and both also 
are being blessed by the relationship. And so let us come into covenant with the Lord or renew our covenants with him now so that as we go forward in worship, we can we can come from the inner uh, court, which is where we are right now, and go into the outer sanctuary, and then he can draw us into the inner sanctuary. So let us say it aloud together. Today and every day, we commit ourselves to a covenant love relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We submit ourselves to his perfect will for his purpose and glory. We will be his people and he will be our God. We are worshipers of the one and only true God in the form of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is the head of every area of our lives. We are members of the body of Messiah, redeemed by his sacrifice, carrying our own crosses and following him as his disciples. We are consecrated to the Lord our God dedicated to the fulfillment of his will and purpose, cleansed regularly of all that would defile us and set apart from the world and worldliness. We will be careful to follow all the commands of the Lord as detailed in his word and as we receive them individually and collectively from the voice and spirit of God. We will walk circumspectly in the world in all of our dealings as ambassadors to the kingdom of God and as beacons of light for others. We will not worship any person, being, or thing in heaven or on the earth besides the Lord our God. We will not make covenants that are contrary to our covenant with God. Contrary covenants come in three forms. Covenants with spirits, including fear, pride, lust, falsehood, folly, sloth, greed, wrath, alcohol, drugs, and others. Covenants with our flesh defeated and servant, and covenants with people who do not serve the Lord our God, such as friendship covenants, marriage covenants, and business covenants. We will serve the Lord with wholehearted devotion and willing minds, for he searches every heart and knows every motive. We bind ourselves to God through our covenant with him, accepting his love and returning it faithfully. Hallelujah, God is so good. And now that we are in right standing with him, we can invite his presence to minister all the more to us and we can begin to address our sins as well. And so Elder Tamise is going to lead us in the liturgy, singing the Shema, Mika Mocha, and we'll prepare me to be a sanctuary. Then we'll go into worship with the being led by the Davids, and through all this time, we'll be addressing our sins, confessing and repenting of sin, allowing him to, 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 to deliver us and minister back into us that we might thank him and adore him, and he can draw us deeper into his presence. Amen. So at this time, we are invited to continue to invite Abba into this atmosphere uh, by singing Shema Israel, which means to hear and obey. Mi Kamoka, who is like our God? And then, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. If you don't know the words, that is okay. Uh, just sing with the melody that the Lord has placed in your heart. So at this time, Shema Israel. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohei. Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Mahuto Leolam Vayed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Amen. Mi Kamoka, who is like our God. Mi Kamoka, Mikamoka Mikamoka Nedar Bakodesh Norata Hilot Norata Hilot Ose Who is like the Lord? 
Who is like thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorified in holiness? He is awesome. You are awesome in praise, doing wonders, O Lord, who is like the Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, pure and holy. Tried and true, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, sanctuary. Lord, for you, Lord, prepare me, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy. Tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living you. And at this time, I would like to hand it over to the Davids for a time of praise and worship.
want to encourage you all to prepare yourselves to enter into God's presence. That is the title of the sermon. I know for some of you, you've been in God's presence, <laughs> but the Lord is calling them deeper. Others have not been in God's presence, and the Lord is calling them in. And so we want to get to the place where we are absolutely in the presence of God, and He is doing exactly what He wants to do. Um, in each and every one of us. Amen. Hallelujah. Tremendously excited about what God is doing. I want to encourage you to let him keep ministering to you. So uh, I'm going to take you to Isaiah chapter 30. We're actually going to be in Isaiah chapter 30 um, and also in 29. We'll be in chapter 29 and 30 of the book of Isaiah. Um, but I want to take you to chapter 30 right now. So I'm going to read verses 15 and verses 20. In 21, in your hearing, as we look at this topic, enter God's presence. And it reads as follows in the NIV. This is the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, and repentance and rest is your salvation. And quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Now let's look at verses 20 and 21. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity, and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Hallelujah, let us pray. Father, we lift you up and we worship you, Lord God. And we praise you that you're calling us to a place of, of, of rest. You're calling to a place of repentance, even as we have a double Shabbat this evening and there's warfare all around us in the spiritual realm, and Israel is in, in a natural war. Lord, we thank you, hallelujah, that you are ministering rest and repentance unto us and also unto your people, Israel. You're calling us to a place of rest and repentance, and we can only find it in your presence. Hallelujah, Father. We praise you for your great grace and for your great shalom. Hallelujah. We praise you, hallelujah, for all you are, for all you're doing. We thank you for your ministry to us as individuals. We thank you for your ministry to Israel. Hallelujah, Father. And we ask that you bring us into greater alignment with you at this moment, that you would have your way in us. Speak to us, Lord, that we would understand your will and then speak through us, that you would move throughout the earth. We praise you for that. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen and amen. Hallelujah. So as we look at this scripture, we're actually going to see some things we're going to see some themes. We're going to see some groups that God is speaking to. So I got to give you some background because today's sermon is a prophetic sermon and that um, there's scripture in front of us, but I'm going to share with you our prophetic revelation that God gave for that time, the time that Isaiah spoke this scripture, but also prophetic revelation for our time. And so these scriptures, as you look at Isaiah chapters 29 and 30, Isaiah was prophesying to King Hezekiah in Judah. At this time, it was prophesied the king Hezekiah in Judah, and this was um, in 701 BC. So the context of the scripture is that the northern kingdom um, that, that had taken the name Israel has been taken captive by Assyria. Hezekiah has watched that kingdom fall. Assyria has now come into Judah, and the, the, the cities of Judah have been besieged by Assyria and Assyria has made its way all the way to Jerusalem and has besieged Jerusalem and Hezekiah is crying out to God the people of, of Judah are crying out to God and Isaiah is prophesying to them these prophecies in, in Isaiah chapters 29 and 30 are specifically to the people of Judah at that time and specifically to King Hezekiah at that time it's important that we understand that because there is a natural context with, within which uh, Isaiah is speaking, but he is also speaking of end times. He's speaking of the times that we're in right now. And the reason we know that this is a dual prophecy is because he specifically speaks of the millennial reign. There are things that he drops into this prophecy that, of course, we know the Lord had him to deposit into this prophecy that let us know that there's a dual time stamp on this prophecy, that there's a time stamp that speaks directly of, of, of uh, Hezekiah's time and Isaiah's day, but then there's a time stamp that, that reveals the millennial reign, which speaks to us about end times, because the millennial reign is spoken of here, and you're going to see that happens throughout Hezekiah's, I mean, throughout um, Isaiah's prophecies, where he's talking about things that are happening right then, and then he's going to, he throws in things about the millennial reign, which lets us know that that prophecy is also going to apply to end times, 
Now, as we look at this, what we're going to see is that two groups need to receive the end time word of God. Two groups. Of course, Judah had to receive the, 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 the timely word during Hezekiah's day. We understand that and they did receive it. They did receive it and God showed up miraculously for Judah. However, the end time prophecy that is built into this prophecy, this dual prophecy, the end time word must be received right now by Israel, the nation of Israel, and by the body of believers. The end time message in Isaiah chapters 29 and 30 must be received by Israel and the global body of Messiah right now. And this is very important that we get in. So as I'm speaking to you, I want you to hear what God is saying to Israel so you can pray more effectively for Israel that is right now at war and, 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 and uh, looking into negotiating a ceasefire. Like this is what's happening in real time while I'm talking to you. Uh, but then also I want you to see it for yourself. I want you to see this message for yourself. I want you to understand what God is saying to you, what God is saying to the believers uh, worldwide right now. Because Israel is God's prophetic time clock. When we see what's happening in Israel in the natural, we understand what's happening with God's people globally in the spiritual realm. So if we see over 2,000 rockets coming into Israel, a nation that's about the size of New Jersey, a barrage of attacks, and, 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 and we see the international community pressing Israel to compromise that they could come into a quick peace, then we understand that the global body Messiah is in the same place, under tremendous fire, a barrage of attacks from the enemy, and also attempts of, on the enemy's part to draw us into quick compromises so that we can have uh, immediate uh, release, so that we can have some immediate a gratification or a little bit of comfort, a little bit of peace and a, a false peace even of that in a moment. So if we get that, we'll understand what's been happening in our lives. We'll understand why we're having the fight and other believers are, are, are seemingly in the fight of our lives and the fight of our salvation. Like you guys will not believe how many texts, emails, calls I received in the last week or so. Um, not just about Israel, because that's been a barrage of those, but about people's lives. This person is sick. This person is hospital. This person is having an emergency. This person is challenged. This person has passed away. I, and it, it's been so much, but it's not surprising to me because of what we see happening in the life. The Lord is showing us what's happening in the spiritual realm. And he always will. It's very important that we get that, that the destiny of the body of believers is inextricably bound up with the destiny of the nation of Israel. So we have to keep our eyes on Israel. And so now, as we look at this message titled, Enter God's Presence, that's what we're going to look at. Enter God's Presence. We're going to see some things. We're going to see some things. And so I want to actually go through these themes with you. The first one is dullness. I need you guys to see the dullness of God's people. And, and, and there's a reason that we're showing that, that you've got to look at. you got to take a look at, at our dullness, the fact that we're dull to the things of God, dull to what he's saying, dull to how he's moving. The next thing that you want to see is trouble, because then trouble comes. Because we're dull, trouble shows up. Now, of course, the enemy is attacking, but our dullness allows even more of the, of the trouble to show up. So dullness, trouble. Then we want to look at alliances. Because then we try to solve the problem ourselves. We form alliances, not just with people, but with our flesh, with things. We form all types of alliances. But God himself will give us deliverance, which is the fourth topic. And then finally, we're going to look at the millennial reign. Now, all of this that I said, you're going to find that in these scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 29 and 30, you're going to find dullness, trouble, alliances, deliverance, and millennial reign. You're going to find all five of them in these scriptures. And again, this was a prophecy that was very timely in Hezekiah's time. The Lord literally did exactly what he said he was going to do in this scripture. But then he also spoke of our time. And, it's, and, and it is time stamped by the fact that he mentioned the millennial reign. And so we'll see that as we go finally through. The reason I'm covering these topics with you is because I want to show you uh, what God is calling us to. We started with the scripture and Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, he's calling us to repentance and rest. 
And then also in verses 20 and 21 of Isaiah chapter 30, the Lord is telling us that though he's given us the bread of adversity and the word of affliction, our teachers will be hidden no more. And he's speaking specifically of the Holy Spirit ministering to us. The Holy Spirit will speak to us. But this only happens when we enter God's presence. And so we want to look at, we want to look at what's happening. And then we want to understand how to enter the God's presence. And this is essential because we are in Shabbat right now. But then we're also going into Shavuot tomorrow, also known as Pentecost, the day where God releases his spirit upon us. So we need to know how to enter into God's presence. And we need to understand the things that we've got to address within ourselves, the things we need to deal with in order to really come into the presence of the Lord. And so we're going to start with this topic of dullness. So in Isaiah chapter 29, you're going to see in verses 9 through 16, God speaks of actually having poured a spirit of stupor over the prophets, over the wise men, over the sages, over the seers, that they're not seeing clearly, their prophetic visions aren't clear, and that their eyes are closed, and the things are sealed for them, their heads are covered, and, and, and the, the scroll, which is going to demonstrate revelation from heaven, the scrolls are sealed. You'll see that in, in verse 11. And the Lord tells us in verses 13 through 16, why? Why is there a dullness? Well, it's because he says in verse 13, these people approach me with empty words. And they are, and the honor they bestow upon me is mere lip service. While in fact, they have distanced their hearts from me. And their fear of me is just a mitzvah, just a commandment of human origin. And that's from the complete Jewish in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you, the reason you got to understand this is because when we see that there's, there's a dull spirit, not discerning the times, not knowing that, you know, hey, we're under attack and the enemy's trying to do these things to us, not seeing it coming. We got to ask the Lord why. Well, what he's saying is you're not in my presence. This is what he's summing up in verses 13 through 16 of Isaiah chapter 29. Well, you're not coming into my presence. You know, you give me this religious talk. You know, you're saying that you think you're a good person. But you actually think you've hidden your sin from me. It actually says it in verse 15. Woe to those who burrow down deep to hide their plans from Adonai. We can't hide anything from God. But we, we think we've hidden stuff down in our hearts and in our souls that the Lord can't see. We think that he's not paying attention. But he absolutely is. He absolutely is. And he sees everything. And though we try to come into his presence, we're not coming into his presence in the way that he has ordained. Very important that we understand it. Now we're looking at ourselves as a body of believers right now, but we've also got to look at contemporary Israel. We know that there is that there are, are thousands of believers in Israel. Absolutely. Christians, Messianic Jews, Messianic Gentiles. Lots of those who profess Messiah Yeshua or even Jesus Christ in Israel, but there are so many others who do not. So many others who do not. And so when I talk about the body of believers, I'm talking about believers in Israel too. So all of us all over the world are in the same category. But when I'm talking about the nation of Israel now, I'm speaking generally of Israel as not yet believing. Whether it's Israelis or Palestinians, those who don't yet receive Yeshua as their Lord and Savior. So when we look at the nation of Israel not having acknowledged Yeshua as the Messiah yet, um, we see a lot of religious activity. Even as we saw it on um, uh, during the time of the counting of the Oma, when there were many Jews celebrating and worshiping, and then it turned to tragedy, deaths and destruction and writing. It was, it was really bad. And the, the nation of Israel had to come in with buses to bring religious Jews out. And so we've seen even uh, uh, rabbinical uh, uh, students, we've seen Orthodox Jews rioting because of the, 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 the shutdown from social distancing. This is prior to the war, you guys. We've seen all types of unrest in Israel coming from the religious sect, but still offering the Lord lip service, still offering prayers, still offering uh, worship to him. But the Lord is saying, you have not approached my presence. You've not come to me the way I'm calling for you. Now, we know he's calling for us through the blood of Messiah. As a body of believers, we know he's calling for us through the blood of Messiah. But we've forgotten that there's an order for entering into his presence. Jews who don't yet believe, particularly in the land of Israel, they know there's an order for entering to his presence, but they haven't yet applied the blood of Messiah. You see what I mean? So now all of us are out of position in that particular revelation. We're out of position because we place both. 
We need to know the order to approach God and we got to rightly apply the blood of Messiah. Hence, this message is for all of us right now, that we would come to him and, and, and truly repent of being religious and also of just taking that blood for granted and thinking we can hide our plans from the Lord and he just will accept it. So we're still talking on point number one, which is dullness. I want to take you to Isaiah chapter 30, verses 8 through 11, because the Lord continues to talk about dullness. He talks about the fact that this prophecy needs to be written on a scroll. And we have the scroll. It's the scroll of Isaiah. <laughs> it was written down. Isaiah captured it. It's written on a scroll. And he said it needs to be a witness against these rebellious children. In verse 9, he calls, he says, for these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. Now remember, we're looking at two groups, the global body of Messiah and the nation of Egypt. And he's saying to us, we have not, we have not accepted his instruction. Why? In verse 10, it says, they say to the seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things prophesy illusions verse 11 this is isaiah chapter 30 um verse 11 leave this way get off this path and stop confronting us with the holy one of israel so that was isaiah chapter 30 verses 8 through 11 now why is this important to the topic of dullness well the lord is saying that i've been trying to talk to y'all i've been trying to reveal my truth to you but you only want to hear pleasantries you don't want me to tell you that you're under attack you don't want me to tell you what the enemy's trying to do to you. You want to comfort yourself. And even when I send those with the revelation that you would repent and that you would put your full armor on and that you would get into gear and get into position, you reject that because you'd rather somebody prophesy pleasantries to you. And this is so important that we get that. It's very, very important that we get that because we saw that among the religious in Israel, like in the midst of, of a, a, a serious outbreak of COVID, 19, they still wanted to do everything they did without any government restriction. They completely, I'm telling you, the, 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 the Orthodox in, in, in Israel, particularly in Jerusalem, completely rebelled against all of the, the, the mandates that came from the national government. Completely. Saying, saying that it was a religious um, oppression. But then we saw COVID spreading among them. And we saw deaths and we saw things happening. Um, but most, so you don't want to hear anything. You want to hear about the actual challenge that's happening right now. You'd rather just keep going on and, and worshiping and being religious, but you don't want to hear what I'm trying to, sh to show you, to see what's actually happening, that, that they were coming to a new season, an end time season where you're going to have to shift in some way. Additionally, we see that with the body of believers. We, we're broken into all these different groups. And each group has its own soapbox and each group has its own mantra. And we're willing to listen to prophets that tell us about our own mantra, but we don't want anybody to convict us of the things we haven't agreed to. And we'll point out everybody else's issues, but we don't want anybody convicting us of our own. When the reality is God is convicting all of us right now. And he's using us to sharpen each other. But rather than listening to each other and seeing the ways where we fall short, we rather blame, accuse, judge, point fingers, get, get all the attention off ourselves than really reflect and repent in the way God is calling us to. Yes, each one of us has some revelation, and it's right. But there are other believers who also have revelation. That's right. <laughs> and even though they don't agree with our revelation, that's right. Doesn't mean everything they're saying is wrong. <laughs> and, and, but we've rejected a lot of truth because of the sources that the truth is coming from. Because uh, they won't listen to us first. <laughs> and so we reject those things that God is saying through them. This is so important that we get that because at this time, the Lord is trying to bring us to a place where we're prepared for, of course, what you know the fifth point is, the millennial reign. So now, as we see this dullness, this dullness is, 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 is coming over us because we rejected the truth. We're rebelling against the correction, rebelling against the prophecy, rebelling against the Lord trying to redirect us. So now we've got to go to number two because now we got some trouble. Now we're in trouble. <laughs> we're experiencing some very real trouble. And you're going to see that we'll go to Isaiah chapter 29 and verses one through six, you're going to see real trouble where literally the Lord starts it off. I'm going to read it in the complete Jewish because you, you'll hear the, the language better. It says, woe to Ariel, Ariel, the city where David encamped, celebrate the feast for a few more years, but then I will bring trouble to Ariel. There will be mourning and moaning as she becomes truly an Ariel for me. Now, let me explain to you what's happening there. This is Isaiah chapter 29, verses 1 and 2. Uh, of course, I want you to look at that whole section. Though. Isaiah 29, 1 through 6. 
but I just read verses one and two. Ariel means two things. It means lion of God. It also means fireplace or altar of God, meaning a place of a fire for the Lord, okay? Now, he's speaking of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the lion of God. The lion is actually the symbol of the city of Jerusalem. You see it on the Jerusalem flag. You get the lion of Judah. But he's speaking also the fact that the altar is there. Jerusalem is the center of worship. So he's saying at this place in Jerusalem, that's my lion, that's my altar. You go on and celebrate. Keep celebrating. Keep doing what you're doing and being religious. But trouble is coming and you're missing it. And if you had been paying attention to what's been going on in Israel, I told you guys what happened during the counting of the Omer. Um, really, a lot of Orthodox Jews died. Celebrating and worshiping like we weren't in the season that we were in. And it turned bad real fast. Um, and and the, the, the nation had to come in. The nation of Israel had to send buses just to bring them out. And a lot of people died. On Monday, when we see the war starting, it was Jerusalem. And what we saw was Muslims on the Temple Mount, because it was still in Ramadan, they are worshiping on the Temple Mount on Ramadan. And then we saw an influx of Orthodox Jews at the Western Wall. Not messing with the Muslims on the Temple Mount. Even though the Temple Mount was Israel, they let them worship there. They were at the Wailing Wall, or the Western Wall, or, 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 or the Kotel, just celebrating. And, and I'm going to tell you, when the Orthodox celebrate, we're talking singing, dancing, music, like it's a party. <laughs> but it's for the Lord. <laughs> the women on the children on one side and the men on another side dancing in circles and there were styles because it was Jerusalem there, a celebration of Jerusalem coming back into the hands of Israel in 1967. So now while the Muslims are here on the Temple Mount for Ramadan, and the Jews are worshiping here at the hotel, Muslims started throwing stones off of the Temple Mount. They set off fireworks, which actually caused a tree to be ignited on fire on the Temple Mount. And then the Israeli police had to, the Jerusalem police had to intervene. Then Hamas said, you got to get those Jews off of the Temple Mount or we're going to start bombing you. We're going to start sending rockets. And in one hour, that's exactly what they did. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. When we look at these verses, the Lord said he's going to bring trouble to Ariel, to Jerusalem. He said, go ahead and, and worship. Celebrate your feast, but then you're going to see trouble. What he's saying is, in this season of extended warfare, intense warfare you're acting like you're not in the midst of war you're acting like enemies are not all around you and, and that's exactly what monday looked like as if th that if this wasn't a dangerous time but the, the interactions between the two groups of worshipers is really what led to the war of course it's un absolutely uncalled for it's uncalled for uh, the rockets coming from hamas is terror it's uncalled for but listen to the point that i'm making i'm not justifying the point that I'm making is being religious and celebrating in the midst of a, a highly charged war-filled time um, is, is, it demonstrates the dullness of not seeking God about what times are we, what should we do. Doesn't mean you don't worship, but you might have to worship while you got somebody standing watch. See, God will show us how to continue to minister. And like, for example, we've been online since last year. Are we still worshiping? Yes, but he told us to shift, we had to shift. Certainly, what we want to still demonstrate our faith, but we got to be listening to the instructions of the Lord in this season. We can't demonstrate our faith in our flesh. We can't demonstrate our faith in our comfort. We have to demonstrate our faith after listening to God. And not just for the instructions for our safety, but also to find out what kind of worship does he even want. He's been speaking to his people, Israel, 2,000 years about receiving the Lord the Messiah, and many have come to the faith. But the group I'm speaking of now have rejected that this year is the Messiah. So even though all that worship was happening on Monday for the Easter day, and it was worship to God, and all that worship that was happening on the mountain for uh, the counting of the Omar, and it was worshiping to God, God wasn't asked, do you want this worship? And God wasn't asked, how should we offer that worship? And that's an example for us because both times ended in tragedy. Not that they, they deserved it. Certainly they didn't ask for it because they should be able to worship in peace. They should. But the enemy is raging because he's desperate right now. I want, to, I want you to think about your own life. What is God calling you to? Worship? Absolutely. But how is he telling you to worship? 
I guarantee you he's shifting some stuff in you now. He don't want it to look like it looked before. He wants you to enter his presence a different way. He wants more discipline. He wants the schedule to change. He wants the discipline to change. He's asking us for different things in this season. Are you shifting? Are you continuing to do what you've already done? Because he may not want that kind of work anymore. Or he may want you to shift because of the environment, because of the season. God is showing us what he needs. But the problem is when we don't listen because of the dullness, because we want to do what we want to do, we'd rather be comfortable and, and think about pleasantries and deal with the reality of the season that we're in. Then the enemy will start to encamp about us when we open our eyes to things like this. This is what we see in Isaiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 6. Feasting and celebrating on the feast days, and all of a sudden, the enemy has shown up and surrounded the whole city. That's what happened in Hezekiah's day. This is how things shifted that fast on Monday. And, and this is important because shifts are happening in your life just like that, too. Have you been on great highs and then all of a sudden attack, boom, low? What happened? God was trying to tell you. He's trying to minister to you, not just you, all of us. He's trying to tell us things. And so he really needs us to enter his presence. He doesn't need that, that religious, that emotional worship anymore. He needs to go in. Because when we're in, we're going to hear that voice behind us telling us, this is the way. Walk in. We're going to hear the instruction of the Holy Spirit. We're going to get uh, the way that God wants to lead us. So now in Isaiah chapter 30, verses 12 and, uh, through 14, and also verses 16 and 17, you're going to see this trouble again, where the trouble is spoken of again, how it comes forth upon um, Israel, of course, in Hezekiah's day, but we want to, we want to talk about it in our own time. In verses 16 and 17, the Lord says, so when, when all this trouble comes, you're not prepared, so you're going to flee. It actually says you're going to flee on horseback, on swift horses, you're going to flee, and that's not what God was telling you to do. He didn't want them to flee. He wanted them to take their stand. But they weren't ready to take a stand. They had to flee. And so their reaction has been to flee, to, to, to run away uh, from this enemy that has shown up. But that's not the very thing God wanted them to do in verses 16 and 17. In verses 12 through 14, the Lord has said, because you relied on falsehood, on oppression, on the wrong message, not the message I sent, it's going to come crumbling down on you. It's going to come crumbling down on you. And we actually literally saw that during the counting of the Omer, uh, when Jews were worshiping on the mountain, actually there was a structure that collapsed. And this is why everybody had to run. Everybody was running and fleeing. And then, and then the, 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 the national government had to send in buses to pull them out because the structure collapsed. And they had to then flee. So people were even getting stampeded because the, the structure collapsed. This is happening to believers all over the world. What's collapsing in your life? What has fallen down? You thought it was going to be a sturdy, something you could depend on. What has shifted and moved and you didn't expect it to move? What God is saying, I already have shifted from that. You missed that I have moved from that because you weren't coming in, you weren't entering my presence. And this is so important that we get that because the reality is the type of worship that was being offered during the counting of the Omer during the time when the structure collapsed and everybody's running uh, for their lives, it's not the worship the Lord wants anymore. They're actually celebrating the birthday of a rabbi. They're celebrating some things that happened, you know, years ago in Israel. And the Lord's like, I, I have shifted. I have shifted. I'm not there anymore. And this is so important that we get that because he's made some shifts in our lives too. Have we moved or have we have we felt the weight of structures coming crumbling down upon us? Trouble. Number three, alliances. Now we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 30, verses one through seven. And in, in, in this scripture, the Lord, he, he talks to his obstinate children. Woe to the obstinate children. Woe to the obstinate nation. Woe to the rebellious children. Why? What are they doing? They are making alliances, not by his spirit, piling sin upon sin. That was verse one of Isaiah chapter 30. But it continues on. So I'm reading all the way through verse seven. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase it. They go down to Egypt to create an alliance. But Egypt will bring them only shame and curse because Egypt cannot save them from the enemies that have surrounded them, from the enemies that are attacking them. And it says, you take your treasures on your back and go all the way through the desert of the negative to bring these treasures to Egypt to seek their help, but they're not going to be able to help. Now let's talk about Israel in contemporary times right now. Right now, the ambassador from Egypt is in Tel Aviv, is in Israel, trying to broker a peace deal. And what did the Lord say? Egypt's not going to be able to help you. 
Now, in Isaiah chapter 39, I'm not going to send you there, but in Isaiah chapter 39, envoys from Babylon show up to Hezekiah after Assyria leaves and God deals with Assyria. Envoys from Babylon show up and Hezekiah shows them everything. He lets the Babylonians in and shows them everything. And then Isaiah tells him, Babylon's going to come back and then Babylon will be your enemy. Now, guess what other ambassador is in Israel right now working with the ambassador from Egypt? The ambassador from the United States. The Egyptian ambassador and, and the American ambassador have come together in Israel to try to broker a peace deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Literally what we're seeing in the spiritual realm is spiritual Egypt and spiritual Babylon. Egypt and Babylon have shown up in Israel to try to create peace. Now, what do we think that's going to look like? In the spirit, Egypt represents the place God brought you from. He delivered you from that and doesn't want you to go back. Babylon represents the allure of the world, the compromise, the, the false peace that, that speaks to what you really want deep down inside to get you out of alignment with God. And it's sad for me to say as an American that that spirit of Babylon is at work in us, but it is. As we go over and as we put pressure on Israel, we are not putting pressure on Israel from a kingdom mindset. We're doing it from Babylon, from the spirit of Babylon. So literally, Egypt and Babylon are in Israel right now trying to influence the Israeli leaders to create yet another false peace. We've done it in the past, and we're trying to do it again. As you pray for Israel, pray that Israel will continue to stand against both of those wars, against both of the spiritual forces. And pray for the ambassadors as well. I've been praying for the ambassadors. That God will minister to them, that God will speak to them, and that the spirit of the kingdom will lead their word, particularly the American ambassador. That the spirit of the kingdom will guide their word rather than the spirit of Babylon guide them their word. Because Egypt and Babylon, Egypt can't help. Babylon will, will broker a false peace just to secure its own interest and then actually cause destruction, which is exactly what happens in Isaiah 39. And it's important that you get that because Egypt and Babylon have shown up in your life too. What old stuff has shown up? Old thoughts, old people, old habits, old ways. That's Egypt. What from Egypt has shown up in your life to try to get you to go backwards? To try to convince you that you aren't really delivered. To try to convince you that's who you are. Egypt has been showing up in the lives of believers. What about Babylon? What has been trying to appeal to your flesh? What has been trying to, to lull you into complacency? What has been trying to get you into a false compromise? That's Babylon. And we've got to get that because we see it happening with Israel. It's also happening with us. And, and this, is, this is important that we understand because you see it clearly. If you allow the Lord to remove the spirit of dullness from you and you see it for what it is, he will bring you out, allow you to resist the temptations and the false compromises, right? And then you can pray fervently for Israel that Israel can continue to resist because this is the reality. When Israel resists, that's when the nations will continue to put pressure. And the one who's going to solve it is Yeshua himself. As long as Israel compromises with Egypt and Babylon and the nations in general, it prolongs Yeshua's coming. But when Israel takes a stand and says, no, we're not listening to the nations. We're going to stand. And when they take that stand, and all the nations, possibly even the United States, I'm trying to pressure Israel, compromise, compromise, compromise. That's when the Lord comes back. Pray for Israel to stand. As hard as it is, as costly as it is, pray for Israel to stand. And pray that you too will stand. Now, let us continue <laughs> to look at number four, deliverance. You see, when you, when you resist those alliances with Egypt and Babylon, then deliverance comes. <laughs> see, if you go fix it yourself, if you're going to fix it, if you got this, God don't need to deliver you. Because you got it. You're going to make an alliance over here. You're going to make an alliance over there. What do you need the Lord for? But when you say, I resist them, these temptations, these alliances, I'm not doing it. I'm not compromising. No. When you resist, God delivers you. So let's look at deliverance. Isaiah chapter 29, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> the Lord tells them, this is so beautiful. Then all the nations fighting Ariel, everyone at war with her, the ramparts around her, the people that troubled her, will fade like a dream, like a vision in the night. Verse 9, I mean, verse 8. It will be like a hungry man dreaming he's eating and he wakes up and his stomach is still empty. Or a thirsty man dreaming he's drinking and he wakes up and he's dry and exhausted. It will be like this for the hordes of all the nations fighting against Mount Zion. And in, in Hezekiah's day, that 
he had. They surrounded Jerusalem and then they went to sleep. And the next morning, 185,000 Assyrian troops didn't wake up. They were just dead. The Lord killed them. They were gone. And it's so important that you understand that because he was speaking literally. <laughs> when the Lord says this to Hezekiah, he was speaking literally. These guys who you see today, you will never see them again. They're going to be gone. I'm going to get rid of these guys. <laughs> and you'll see that in Isaiah chapter 38, verse 36. It says, the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 men in the camp of Asher or Assyria. Early the next morning, there they were, all of them corpses, dead. I Meaning they went to sleep dreaming. We're going to take over Jerusalem. And they woke up and they was dead. <laughs> they woke up in the place of the dead. Gone. Your enemies will be gone. When you resist the devil, he will flee from you. But you have to submit first to God. This happened in Hezekiah's day. It absolutely happened. And the Lord is saying it will happen with Israel too. You know why? Because Messiah is going to come and he's going to deal with everybody. Just like that. Just like that. Look at Zechariah chapter 14. Just like that. He deals with the enemies like that. It's, it's instant. And, and this is so important that we get that because the truth is the enemy can put so much pressure on us that we, we don't feel like deliverance can be instant. We feel like we have to compromise. We got to give in a little bit because it's too much pressure. It's just too much. 2,000 rockets. Actually, at this point, it's, 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 it's kind of getting closer to 3,000. It's a lot. Look at the barrage against you. It's a lot. And the Lord is saying, no, don't give in. Don't back down because I'm going to show up for you just like that. I'm going to push back the enemy. And he won't be able to touch you anymore. Now, let's look at this deliverance again. You're going to see it in Isaiah chapter 30. You're going to see it in verse 15. You're going to see it in verse 18 through 25. You're going to see it in verses 27 through 33. That was also going to lead us to our last point. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. And what you're going to see here is that the Lord is saying, that's, of course, the verse I gave you at the beginning, and repentance and rest is your salvation. He's telling us where the deliverance is. To rest in him and to repent. We're going to talk about how do you do this. And quietness and trust is your strength. Now, most of us don't think, how can I be strong if I'm quiet? I'm, I'm, I'm out of doing something to be strong. We're like, nope. Be still and know that I'm God. Okay? Then he says, but you would have none of it. So he's saying you're resisting the deliverance. I need you to enter my presence. Because this right here, repentance, rest, quietness, and trust, it happens in his presence. Don't resist the presence because the deliverance happens right in his presence. We'll talk about that even more in a little bit. So now looking at verses 18 through 25, you're going to see that the Lord is being gracious to Israel. He's compassionate. We're still in Isaiah chapter 30. Verses 18 through 25. And so he's compassionate, he's gracious, he's the God of justice. And it says, blessed are all who wait for him. That's in verse 18. Blessed are all who wait for him. Why? Because he's going to show up when he hears your cry. He's going he's to minister in your ear. He's going to send the Holy Spirit telling you which way you should walk. And you're going to get rid of all of your idols. And he's going to send you the rain on the seed that you've sown so that your fruit and your harvest is plentiful. And then you will have peace and you will have shalom. And then as he describes this shalom, you're going to see verses 27 through 33 that he has this amazing revelation. He releases this amazing revelation of him coming from afar and he's, on, he's riding on smoky cloud and he breathes life into you and, and he sings this song over you and you'll be able to worship like he's on a feast day and your heart is going to be He's going to be happy because his glorious voice will be heard and his arm will descend to deliver you. And you know his arm from Isaiah chapters 52 and 53, that's the shoot. His arm goes down and descends and it pulls you out. That's in verse 30. His arm descends and pulls you out. And, and his furious anger comes forth and the Lord then terrifies your enemy who is Assyria and he knocks them out with his scepter and, and his beautiful arm just is strong in battle. You see that in verse 32 and his arm, of course, is Yeshua. <laughs> and we see this glorious victory that God gives us over the enemy. Now that literally happened for Hezekiah. I told y'all the Lord, the, the angel of the Lord, I just read it in your hearing, put 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrian army to death like that overnight. Boom, his mighty arm came and wiped them out. And then that king went back home and his own sons killed him. Boom, wiped out. I'm, t I'm serious. He would do it that quickly for us in our lives as well, but he would also do it that quickly for Israel. That quickly. He'll show up, crack the sky, get rid of the enemies. Now he's ruling the world from Jerusalem. That fast. That fast. And that is the times that we're in. 
I know y'all don't think those are the times we're in, but those are the times we're in. We're absolutely in those times. Almost every sign that the scripture says has to happen has already happened. Just because it didn't happen in America doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Just because it didn't happen, you know, in our neck of the woods and our own lives doesn't mean it didn't happen. Even some of the things he says have to happen in Israel have happened, but they happened in secret. But they happened. So we're at a place where we need the Lord to come back in again. And he is waiting for us to take our sin. He's waiting for Israel to take their sin. And this is so important because we've got to be one. Both Israel and the body of believers, the Jews, the Gentiles have to be one. That's what Shavuot, that's what tomorrow is all about. And when he returns, we'll be going to the next month, the millennial reign. When he returns, we will be one. Everyone who loves him, everyone who serves him, we will be one in his kingdom. No matter where we're from, no matter what we look like, we're going to be one in his kingdom. And I love this because you see these beautiful little inserts. These little inserts in these scriptures in Isaiah chapter 29 and Isaiah chapter 30, where he speaks of the millennial reign. Now, now Isaiah was prophesied in Hezekiah. And almost everything Isaiah says literally happens in Hezekiah's time. But not these parts about the millennial reign. That didn't happen. Why? Because it was a key, a little, little nugget dropped in there for us who would read it thousands of years later to know that this prophecy was also for us. So we would get that though it had been fulfilled in Hezekiah's time, we need to apply it in our time right now. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 29. We're going to look at verses 17 through 24. Now we're on the millennial reign. In verses 17 through 24, the Lord actually talks about uh, um, <clears throat> him taking uh, uh, the, the Lebanon. Um, he said, in a very short time, will not the Lebanon be turned into a fertile field? And that fertile field will become a forest. Now, that place had been damaged by war. This is going to be just north of Israel. Right now, rockets have been coming in from the from Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. Rockets have been coming from the Lebanon. The Lord says, no, it's going to be a photo field. It's going to be, it's going to be beautiful pasture. See, that didn't happen back then. But that's coming. And then he says also that the deaf will hear the words of the scrolls. See, those who have been told, won't listen to the prophecies, the scrolls will be open. They get the revelation. They'll understand what they did not yet understand. All of it's going to become clear. The blind will see, and the humble will rejoice, and the needy will rejoice, and the ruthless will vanish, and the mockers will all disappear. Now, we know Assyria disappeared, but he's talking about all of them on the earth. Why? Because he's still going to be willing the world from Jerusalem. And this is so important that we get that because we see this beautiful restoration that the Lord gives, where, where he says very clearly that Israel, Jacob, in verse 22, will not have to be ashamed anymore. They'll see their children. Um, when, when they see among them their children, the work of my hands, then they'll keep my name holy. I mean, he's going to protect Israel. Who's right now battle weary? People are living in storm shelters. Some of the summit storm shelters have been busted open with rockets, and people have died as little children. And, and so he's saying they're going to find all of this, this shalom in me. And in verse 24, those who are wavered in spirit will gain understanding, and those who complain will accept instruction. So even in our own spirits, when we were like, you know, uh, braying donkeys against him, we'll become humble and we'll receive from him because he's going to minister to us through his spirit. Now, that all didn't happen during Hezekiah's time. That's to come. That's what we have to look forward to. You're going to see also in Isaiah chapter 30, a particular verse, verse 36, though literally verses 20, I mean, verse 26, verses 26 to 33, all actually speak of the money around. This is Isaiah chapter 30, verses 26 to 33. But some of it, verses 27 to 33, do talk about the deliverance from Assyria. Verse 26 doesn't have anything to do with what happened in Hezekiah's time. This is for the millennial reign. It's very clear. It's put there on purpose that we would know this is time stamp for our time. Listen to what it says. Moreover, the moon, the light of the moon will be bright as the light of the sun. And the light of the sun will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven days in one. On the day Adonai, the Lord binds up the wounds of his people and heals the bruises caused by the blow. Now, this is so important because we know that by the stripes and side of Yeshua, we're here. The healing comes from Yeshua. Yeshua shows up as the Lord, and he doesn't just restore us. He's going to restore the earth and even the sun and the moon so much so that they're brighter than we've ever seen them. Probably they're being restored to how bright they were when the Lord first created them. He's going to restore everything in ways that we've never imagined. Like grass will probably be greener. 
Like, like everything will be different. He says very clearly that the lion will lay down with the lamb. Like, like stuff is going to change. <laughs> we, it'll be like we never, ever experienced. There will be such shalom and restoration that we can't even imagine it. But Isaiah speaks very clearly. And that scripture right there lets us know this was for a time to come. This wasn't for Hezekiah's time. This is for our time, the time that we're coming into. And so I want to share this with you. I'm going to share my screen with you guys right now because the title of the sermon is Enter God's Presence. The reason that's the title is because we can't do what he calls for. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, repentance and rest is your salvation. Quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. We can't actually receive it. He's saying we're not receiving it. We can't receive it outside of his presence. We have been dull. We have resisted his presence. We've done a lot of hooping and hollering outside of the presence of God. But the Lord is like, I need y'all to come in. I need y'all to come in. And this is a call, no matter how deep you are in relationship with him, he wants to go deeper. And if you don't feel like you have a deep relationship, he wants you to have a deep relationship. And so I'm going to share my screen with you guys. I'm going to take you back to um, the same uh, PowerPoint that we use when we come into service, the one with the temple, uh, the example for temple worship. And the reason I'm going through this with you guys is because I want you to understand all that stuff he just said to us, and even what he's saying to Israel right now, that he is pointing to the way of how we need to worship God. He's showing us how to approach his presence. And we go over this every Shabbat. And we do it so that you would know how to approach a holy God. And the way we go into our service, we actually go through every aspect of this and every little detail of the service. When we have physical worship, live worship, we actually go into different rooms <laughs> so that you can physically see how, you know, you go into the presence of God. But this is really about how you relate to him. It's all about relationship. You could be, you know, it, it, I pray, you know, kneeling by my couch in my office. Um, some people go into a prayer closet. Some people kneel by their beds. Some people sit on their bed. Um, some people are driving in their car. It doesn't matter where you physically are. The Lord wants to take you through the process so you can enter his presence. And I want you to understand what this process means. I want you to get it in your spirit so you can actually receive what he wants. He wants to give you that the, 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 the trust that you need. He wants to give you the rest that you need. He wants to empower you to repent. He wants to empower you to be quiet before him. Because sometimes the truth is we can't even quiet our own minds, right? We can't shut a mouth. It just keeps going and going and going. It's in his presence that that happens. So how this works. I'm going to go through this with you guys. And then we're going to go back into worship. So David's going to lead us back into worship. You know why? Because prayerfully, you have a new revelation. Prayerfully, with this new revelation, now you can say, okay, Lord, I really want to enter in. I might not have entered in earlier. I was distracted or I entered in a little bit, but I want to go all the way in. I want to go all the way in. And I'll tell you why this is important as, as we go through it. So again, of course, you start at the bottom, at the outer court. The outer court is where he prepares you for worship. Now, as believers, we tend to skip that. We skip preparation for worship because we, we got the blood of Messiah. Remember, I told y'all we take it for granted. Israel understands how to come into God's presence. They just, if they haven't yet received Yeshua, they don't have the blood of Messiah. We'll talk about that blood in a minute. But they understand the process. As, as believers, we tend to take the process for granted. Well, I got the blood. He ushered me in and we bombard the, you know, the, the, the place of God's throne and we miss all the beauty that comes with actually walking in order in his presence. There is a preparation for worship. And that preparation comes with removing distraction. It comes with, with, with setting our hearts and minds on him. It comes with finding out what, is the, what it is that he kind of wants that day. Because a lot of times we approach God for what we want that day. When worship is actually from the Lord's perspective. If we're coming to enter into his presence, it's not about what we want. It's about what he wants. And so that preparation should even include me shifting my self-centered thinking to become God-centered. I need to now center my focus on God. What is it that God wants? Because I'm trying to enter his presence. I'm not inviting him to my mess. I want to leave my mess. <laughs> and I want to enter his presence. So I got to shift my focus on to him. And I got to ask him to prepare me. I need him to prepare me. We sing the three songs of the liturgy every week in the exact same way we put the words on the screen so that those songs can be in your spirit. Because the truth of the matter is, God may need to pull those songs up out of your spirit. 
he might need to, 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 to use them to help you to be prepared to start to go in. I'm telling you, he'll do it. God will do it, but you got to have some in your spirit for him to use. <laughs> so we, we give you these tools so that you can actually come into the place of his presence. And so again, that outer court is about how do you want to prepare me, Lord? Sometimes even asking the position, you want me on my knees? You want me to sit down? Do you want me to lay prostrate? See, listening, I'm listening because he's preparing me for the experience he wants me to have. I'm not preparing myself for the experience I want to have. I'm asking him the experience he wants me to have. This is so important because he knows what I need. He made me, not the other way around. What experience do I even need today, Lord? What experience do you want from me? All this is preparation. So get yourself ready. Have your Bible there. Have your notebook there. Because he might talk, <laughs> you know, and you're going to want to write down what he said. Prepare. Prepare to get into his presence, right? Next thing is that now you go into the inner court. So you see we're moving up. Outer court inner court remember the inner court these two things happen covenant and confession and repentance covenant and confession and repentance covenant is about the agreement with god but it's not contractual covenant speaks more of intimacy so really i am renewing my love relationship with him i'm remembering that i'm the bride he's the husband i'm remembering that he's a lover of my soul See, I got to rightly relate to him as I come. I got to remember. I got to remember that covenant relationship. I got to remember the covenant that he's my father. But as we learn in the coffee house right before Mother's Day, he's also my mother. <laughs> I got to I got to remember the, the way he and I relate to each other. And I got to be, be honest. See, now it's moved me right into confession and repentance that I haven't rightly related to him since the last time we talked. In some way, I've dishonored him. In some way, I've I've, I've, I've given him uh, less than the glory that was due his name. I've treated him lightly in some way. I got to acknowledge that. I got to let him then pull up and out of me, all that stuff that's not like him. That's where the confession and repentance comes in because there in the inner court is the altar of burnt offering. And y'all know that we ministered to you guys about how we can receive deliverance through offering spiritual burnt offerings to the Lord. That's why we always encourage you to download our free deliverance workbook at burntoffering.org. We encourage you to do that because we know we need deliverance on a regular basis. And so, yes, we confess, we confess our sins to God. And what does that mean? That means I agree with God that things I've done or even thought, because you might not have done it, you might have just thought it, that it was sinful. It was not his will for me. I got to confess it. And then I ask him to turn me away from it. See, that's repentance. Repentance means to turn away, but we don't have the power to repent. He has to turn us away. So in this area right here in the inner court, I'm asking him to turn me away from the sin. I'm not powerful enough to do it. I'm not asserting that I am. I'm not making any promises that I'm going to turn away because that's just arrogant. Because you, you can't control your own heart. You're saying, God, I want to turn away. Help me. Or if you don't want to turn away, you might say, God, I want to want to turn away. <laughs> Give me the desire. All of that, that conversation is happening right there where we're dealing with our real spiritual condition our real spiritual condition is between you and God. It's not about somebody judging you. It's not about somebody pointing things at you. Certainly not a place of condemnation. It's a place where God himself is ministering that you can release your burdens to him. And those burdens are not just sin. They're also wounds. Who hurt you? Who offended you? Who, who disrespected you? This is where you tell it to him. Right there in the inner court at the altar burnt offering. You put those off, those offerings right there, those arts, you lay them on that. That's the altar where you lay the arts. You say, this person, ought, I ought to be mad at them, Lord, but I don't want to come before you with that type of anger in my heart. I don't want to come before you holding a grudge, holding a record of wrong. It's right here where you deal with that. And in our Shabbat temple services, that would mean it's why the worship team is worshiping. Like at the beginning of worship, <laughs> you're starting to deal with that stuff. You're starting to give that stuff to him. You're offloading it. As believers, we take it for granted. Oh, I'm covered by the blood. We still have to address that stuff, you guys. We have to address that stuff because it does keep us from going in more deeply, more intimately. We got to address it. We got to spend time addressing it. So then from that place, after I have given him the burnt offering that he required, which means I address the sin, the burden, the ox, the offenses that he wanted me to address, not the ones I wanted to address, the ones he put on my heart that he wanted me to address. After I've done that, now I go into 
the outer sanctuary or the holy place. That's where the menorah is, who is Yeshua. He's the light of the world, but he's the middle shaft. And then we're all the branches. So then he lights us with his light in that place. That's the place where the table of showbread is. That's the fellowship. That's not just the fellowship with God. It's the fellowship with each other. It's in that place that God can actually minister to our character so we can be a good people to other people. <laughs> we can be good moms and dads and wives and, and, and husbands. Uh, you know, that, that comes right there in that place where as we're thanking him, as we're pouring out, you know, our thanksgiving and adoration onto him, we're actually receiving from his character. His character starts to pour into us. His Holy Spirit starts to pour into us. We get transformed in that place. The good people we think we are, we actually become those people in that place. The people who have the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. We get all that right there while we're thanking him and adoring him after we've addressed our sins. Now, I'm thanking him, I'm adoring him as those words are coming out of my mouth or as the praise is happening with my hands, as my body is moving in worship, as I'm clapping my hands, I'm singing my song, his character, his spirit is coming into me. His spirit is coming into me. And, and what you need to understand is that in that, that, that outer sanctuary, the holy place, there is the altar of incense. The altar of incense, that incense is our prayers. It's our prayers. It's our worship. It's the, the words we give to God, the thanksgiving, adoration. That's the incense. That's what the incense is. You actually see that in Revelation, probably seen in Revelation chapter 8, where it talks about the prayers of God's people is the incense. That's the incense that's, that's going up in heaven. It's our prayers, our worship, our praise. And so we want to give those sacrifices to God because we gave him the burdens in the outer court. Now in the inner sanctuary, we're giving him the worship. And this, now let me tell you how this works. In Leviticus chapter 16, you see Yom Kippur. And the, the high priest can only go into the most holy place because we're about to go into the most holy place, the inner sanctuary, this part right here, number five. We're about to go into the inner sanctuary, the most holy place. But the priest can only go, the high priest can only go with two things. He had to have incense, which I just told you guys is the prayer, the worship, the praise, the thanksgiving, the adoration. He had to have that, the incense. He also had to have the blood. He also had to have the blood. And that blood was the blood of the sacrifice. And we know Yeshua is the one who sacrificed for us. So we got to have the blood of Messiah. And that blood has to have been already applied to me, my sin condition, my issues, my household. Because we are priests of our household. And that incense has to have already gone up to him. I've been worshiping. I've been thanking him. I've been ministering to him. After I dealt with my sins, my burdens, my offenses. And the high priest was translated spiritually right into the most holy place. The high priest did not walk in there. God had to bring the high priest in there. And in the journals of the, of the high priest over the years actually, actually had that written into it that the Lord would supernaturally bring them into the most holy place. They did not just go in. And they had to have incense and blood. Now, as the body of believers, we know we have to have blood. We think that blood is like a ticket to just get into God's presence. And we miss that he still needs us to deal with all those other things to rightly come before him. So when we bring that blood and that incense, and we just continue to worship. We just continue to worship. Give him more and more incense until he draws into the most holy place. Until you come into his presence. And I'm going to tell you right now, you will know. You will know when you come into his presence because it's going to change. You're going to change. Atmosphere changes. You will know when he has drawn you into his presence. So I want to encourage you to spend that time and make sure that you do get into his presence regularly. Because what happens in his presence, let me tell you what happens in his presence. When we are in his presence, we have direct dialogue. That's when we hear from God. That's when he speaks the instructions that we need. That's when he is, is, is going to actually take, you know, the requests that we have, the real deep heart recess requests. That's when he takes those acts on them and then starts to send the answers back immediately. That happens in the most holy place. In the most holy place, we find out what God's heart is. And he involves us in his mission. And we say yes to his work. That's what happened in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah gets drawn up into the throne room of God, the most holy place. And then God says, who will go for us? He gets to hear the mission that's on God's heart. And then Isaiah gets to say yes to that mission. And he gets sent out from the most holy place. I'm going to tell you what else happened miracles happen from the most holy place. If you've been wondering why signs and wonders aren't happening with the body of believers, because we don't go to the most holy place enough. We don't enter into that. It's in that place that the Lord is able to do miracles and signs and wonders through us. That's why it was so easy for Yeshua. He was always in the most holy place. 
He was always entering the Father's presence rightly and going into that most holy place on a regular basis. So when it was time for the Father to move through him, he already had that holy place anointing on him. They had it in the first century in Acts, which is why people were being healed by their shadows. Because they had watched Messiah Yeshua do it. He pulled away from everybody, spent that time, I'm talking hours, in the presence of the Father, that he could go into the most holy place. He wasn't sleeping. He wasn't distracted. He was ministering before God and allowing God to minister to him so he could go into the most holy place. And it was his own blood that provided the way, but he still entered in the right way. And I, I need y'all to understand this because everything that the Lord has just said to us, the fact that, that we've been dull, the fact that we're experiencing trouble, yes, we're going to be attacked, but that those attacks have become troubling to us. The fact that we're building alliances with Egypt and Babylon and he did not tell us to build. Um, and the fact that though he wants to deliver us, which we see in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, we would have none of it. And then the millennial reign is coming. He's saying all this to us so that we can actually be ready for the millennial reign. The dullness can be removed from us. The trouble cannot be troubled because he's going to minister deliverance to us. The alliance is going to be an option because we will submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. And when our Messiah comes, we have that most holy place anointing. So we should practice God. The anointing on him is the same anointing on us. And we're caught up together with him immediately because we know what it's like. We already know not to think about anything else, not to be distracted by anything else, not to have any care, not to have any burden. We already know how to offload those. And when he comes, all we want is him. I want to encourage you to have that experience with the Lord on a regular basis. And I want you to know that when we have Shabbat temple service or when we have Shabbat service tomorrow, that's, the, that's what we're trying to help facilitate for you that all of us could go in. We want you to go in, but we want you to know how God requires you so that you can enter his presence and you can get exactly what he has for you in a place of his presence. And when you get in there, I'm going to tell you, when you get in the throne room and God starts to talk to you about what's on his heart and you're ministering to him and he's ministering back to you, I'm going to tell you right there, and that's when you pray for Israel. You want to put Israel at his feet when you're in the throne room. So the miracles can show up in Egypt. So the angels can show up in Egypt. That's what Isaiah was doing. When he prayed for Israel. He prayed for Hezekiah. He was going on. The angels showed up. I'm telling you, this, this is how we want to intercede. Don't intercede in the outer court. Don't even intercede in the inner court. Intercede in the most holy place. Wait till you get in. And then say, God, remember Israel. Bring peace to the Israel. Bring salvation to Israel. Bring the sure. See, you pray those prayers there. Whew. And then he releases them right there because you're in the throne room right there. The angels are released right there. Stuff is happening right there. The family members you need to pray for, they don't even have hands when you're in the throne room. Angels, go for it. Go for it. Because you've addressed everything that is between you and God. You've already addressed it. You let him deal with it in you because you approach him the way he said to approach him. And now you can enter his presence and do what he can do. Y'all can be in agreement, you can be on the same page. That is the chamber. Of the husband. That's where intimacy happens, consummation happens. See, we haven't been actually in a love relationship with, with our husband. Just imagine a wife living outside her house, her bed is in the garage. She's not having fellowship with her husband. They're not becoming one. That's where our worship is going on in the garage. He's calling us into the chamber, He's calling us into the bed. Everything we want. And when we come out of that place, guess what? The anointing is still on. And the chamber is going to continue to be. I want to encourage you when we go into worship this time, don't think about nothing else. Don't be looking at the clock. <laughs> Tomorrow is shall oh, We want to let God minister to us today. So the outpouring he's trying to do in shall oh, oh, we ready for it. We want to be ready. We want up the moon outpouring. So we got to do what we got to do today. Amen. Y'all ready? I'm looking at faces. Y'all ready? Give me some thumbs up. Let me know. Come on. Are y'all ready? Are we ready? All right. I'm going to turn it over to the Davids who are going to lead us in worship. And then Ella Tanise is going to um, give us our benediction and our ironic blessing um, as we, whenever we come out of the most holy place <laughs> as the Davids lead us in worship. Amen. Hallelujah.
Father, we thank you. We thank you for such your sweet presence, God. Hallelujah. You minister unto us, Lord, such a sweet aroma in you. You're asking us to do the same thing. You're commanding us, God, to do the same thing, to release a sweet aroma unto you, God. Hallelujah. Not just uh, temp not just something that's temporary, Lord, but for eternity, God. Hallelujah. You're preparing us for eternity, God, by teaching us about how to enter into your presence, to enter into your gates with thanksgiving and enter into your courts with praise and to be thankful. Hallelujah. We thank you, God, for what you have ministered unto us, for you, what you've reminded us of today, God. Hallelujah. What you've introduced to us today, God what you're awaking in us to, God. Hallelujah, this day, God. Hallelujah. We thank you for who you are. There is no one like you, God. There is no one like you, God, above in the heavens or below in the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. You take us by the hand. If we even accept your, your invitation, you want to take us by the hand and take us on a journey called life. You want to take us, Lord, hallelujah, on a journey, God that will allow us to see you as you are, God. Forgive us, God, for wanting to rush from this place to that place, not hearing your voice of this is the way, walk in it, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Individually, forgive us, Lord. Our households, forgive us, Lord, of in our nation, in the world, God. Hallelujah, Israel, God, forgive us, God. You're teaching us about what you want because what you want is good, it's satisfying and it's able to succeed whether we can hear it or see it or not. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for your voice. Thank you for your voice, God. Hallelujah. Saying to trust you to walk this way or that way, God. Hallelujah. Thank you for your voice. Hallelujah. To shut out all the other voices. To shut out all the other sightings, all the other enticements, all the enticements because you're not an enticement all the enticements it is your presence that draws us hallelujah we thank you god we thank you for just even the stirring up lord when there are times of discipline you stir things up lord so that the enemy flees that's why we have to submit to you because you said that if we submit to you and we resist the enemy then the enemy will flee we thank you for such a beautiful model god of how to walk with you through life by looking at the temple model, by looking at the tabernacle model, looking at the model that has been installed in heaven and that you've brought down here to mankind. Hallelujah. We just thank you, Lord. Continue to just translate us, Lord, into your presence, God, as we, we listen to your voice, as we come in to the gates with thanksgiving, and we, we then arrive at the burnt offering site, Lord, where we are to lay our flesh on the altar so that our high priest, hallelujah, Yeshua, can administer the offering over us, God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for the, the, the incense, God. The hallelujah. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. For the ability to even wash our hands, God, in, in, in your presence, God. 
We thank you, Lord, for being able to enter, Lord, hallelujah, to be able to see and be reminded that it's not just about us. You have others around the world. Israel, we are engrafted into Israel. It's not even about us. It's about you, God, hallelujah. We thank you for reminding us of our position today in Yeshua, for reminding us of our role in you to just seek you because you said, if we seek you, we will find you. If we knock, the door will be open. Hallelujah. If we ask, we shall receive. Hallelujah. We thank you. We, we, these things, they seem so simple, but they're not because there's so much stuff inside of us. There's so much junk that's in a way that prevents us from moving from one place to the other that you've called us to God. But we thank you for ever reminding us. You're so gracious but you're such a loving God at the same time. And, and, that, and with that comes a fiery passion because you're jealous. You're jealous for what you've put inside of us and you know what you've put inside of us. Hallelujah, we thank you. We thank you, Father, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for the families that have been represented here, that are represented here today, God. You are moving us from the old season to new place in you. Behold, all things are becoming new. You are restoring things back to order. Hallelujah. We, you're restoring Israel back to order. You're restoring the nations back to order, God. Hallelujah. As we repent unto you, you're restoring all things back to order, God. We ask that you continue to restore our families, restore, God, our health, our spiritual health in you, God. Because if that's restored, other things are going to be restored. Hallelujah. We thank you for these things. We thank you for the, the Shalemim that you, you are, uh, hallelujah, you're, you're allowing us to present unto you, God, for tomorrow, God. For you said that they should come unto you three times a year. Hallelujah. During unleavened bread, Shavuot, and Sukkot. We thank you for these times, your times of refreshing, God. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. For your times of appointings, God. Hallelujah. We thank you. We ask, Lord, that we continue to receive from you. Hallelujah. That you continue to address even fear. Hallelujah. Fear that we will not be able to find you again like this, God, because there's this and that to deal with. The Lord says, let him do what he is destined to do. Hallelujah. The fear, I ask that you remove fear even now, God, for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, God. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord, for the offerings that have come in, Lord. We ask that you multiply, Lord, those that just the, the hallelujah, the, 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 the hands within the hands, Lord, those who gave, that you multiply those things, God, that we know what to do with them, that we won't misappropriate the things, Lord, that you multiply unto us, God. Hallelujah. We thank you for teaching us about stewardship. Today, you have sure, surely taught us about stewarding your presence, how to approach your presence rightly, God. And the end result of that, Lord, is you being magnified amongst us, God. Yeshua being manifested amongst us, not just us here online, wherever we may go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it's not about a prescription. It's about what the Lord has called us to. This is his order. Hallelujah. And we thank you for the voice, your voice, Lord. Hallelujah, ministering that order unto us, God, as we go through the days that you've appointed for us, God. We bless you. We lift up Israel even now, God. We ask, Lord, that you continue to restore. You continue to open eyes. You continue to open ears as to what your right order is for worship, for the approach of you, God, to even be able to stand in this time, to be able to persevere in this time, God. You are awakening hearts, and, and we thank you for that, God. May there be provisions for those who are whose hearts are being awakened even now, Lord that they may know what the next step is in you, God, because they hear the way to walk in this way by your Holy Spirit, God. We thank you for strengthening, Lord, shepherds in the land, God. We thank you for strengthening, Lord, the fivefold in the land, God. Hallelujah. Knowing that Yeshua is the high priest and king. We thank you, God, for strengthening, Lord, those connections between Israel and the nations, God, those you've called to be co-laborers with her, God. We thank you for these things, God. We bless you for the leaders within that nation that you would surround them with godly counsel, God. Hallelujah. And you would scatter the enemy into seven directions, Lord. You said those who pray for her, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
because those who love you will be blessed. And it's not because of the blessing so we can hoard all the possessions and the things that the, and the lands and the descendants that the Lord gives. It's so that we can offer them unto him and the enemies can be scattered in the lands. And that the Lord's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can be confirmed. We thank you. You are a promise keeper. And we bless you for your promises coming forth in a day that we are in, God. Hallelujah. May we continue to persevere because of what you have said and what you've told us to do. We thank you for this in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Amen. If you'll prepare your heart now for the ironic blessing. Yevarecha Yahweh Merecha Yahweh Pana Elecha Vehoneka Yisaya Pana Veleka Veyasem Kashalom Veyasem Kashalom Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh shine his face upon you. Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May Yahweh look upon you and give you his shalom and give you his shalom. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Mashiach. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Be blessed.